Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Daniela Caruso, and I am the, at the law school uh, at Boston University, and I also direct the Center for the Study of Europe. Uh, today's webinar is about a forthcoming book titled Power to the People, Constitutionalism in the Age of Populism. The authors are Boyan Bugaric and Mark Tashnet, both with us today, and the publisher is Oxford University Press. Both the authors of this book and the discussants, Vivian Schmidt and Robert Tsai, are eminent scholars and prolific authors. My introductions will be minimal for the sake of brevity, so apologies in advance for my many omissions. Uh, Boyan Bugaric is a professor of law at the School of Law of the University of Sheffield, where he was appointed to a chair in September 2018. He previously lectured at the University of Ljubljana and served as Deputy Minister of the Interior in the Slovenian government from 2000 to 2004. Professor Bukaric has held several visiting positions, including at the Center for European Studies of Harvard University, and I am very pleased to add that he will be affiliated with our own center next year in Boston in person. His recent publications include a 2019 article titled, Could Populism Be Good for Constitutional Democracy? Which hints at the debate to which this book uh, speaks today. Uh, the article was published by the Annual Review of Law and Social Sciences in 2019. Mark Tashnet is the William Nelson Cromwell Professor of Law Emeritus at Harvard Law School. Professor Tashnet specializes in constitutional law and theory, and he has consistently engaged with the comparative dimension of constitutional law. His research includes studies of constitutional review in the United States and around the world, and the creation of other institutions for protecting constitutional democracy. His recent publications include the book, Taking Back the Constitution, Activist Judges and the Next Age of American Law, published by Yale University in 2020. The two discussants are both our own BU faculty. Vivian Schmidt is Jean Monnet Professor of European Integration, Professor of International Relations in the Paris School of Global Studies, and Professor of Political Science at BU, as well as founding director of this center, the Center for the Study of Europe. Her research focuses on European political economy, institutions, democracy, and political theory. Her most recent book is Europe's Crisis of Legitimacy, Governing by Rules and Ruling by Numbers in the Eurozone. Her current work focuses on the rhetoric of discontent and conducts a transatlantic investigation of the populist revolt. Robert Tsai joined the faculty of Boston University of the School of Law in January 2021 after being a law professor at American University and a chaired visitor at Temple University. His publications include the books America's Forgotten Constitutions, Defiant Visions of Power and Community, published by Harvard University Press in 2014, and Practical Equality, Forging Justice in a Divided Nation, a Norton publication of 2019. He is currently working on a manuscript on the life and times of Stephen Wright, who led the Southern Center for Human Rights for 40 years. Without further ado, I uh, welcome this discussion. Uh, I, ask please the authors uh, to address uh, the main points of their book. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Daniela, for this uh, very generous introduction. It's an immense pleasure to be here. And thank you both uh, Robert and, and Vivian to be so gracious to, to be, uh, accept the invitation to comment on our on our book. So I'll just uh, share my few, I have mostly pictures, so just a... So um, this is this is not the final version of the cover page, it's one of the possible uh, versions. So the Oxford is still working on this. Um, so the, the uh, in this brief 10 to 12 minutes, uh, I was going to briefly discuss what was the animating idea behind the book that we wrote with Mark together, uh, and uh, uh, explain just a few sort of um, snapshot parts of the book of course because you know I, I can't say much about all the all the parts of the book our sort of a general discomfort, discomfort with the literature and the debate around populism when we started to discuss about writing a book together was with the following thing so when we uh, approached the subject we did a few you know as usual conferences and papers and presentation and so on and then we, re we realized that the mainstream the common sort of narrative about populism has a sort of clinches to a certain frame, which is actually in my, in my next slide, uh, which portrays the populism as something, you know, uh, antithetical to constitutionalism. So the language basically says that populism as such, you know, has a sort of, you know, big 
uh, you know, is in big conflict with constitutionalism, uh, contradicts constitutionalism, undermines constitutionalism, and so on. And there was a, you know, a, 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 a lot of literature in the last couple of years elaborating on this point. I just uh, put on, on this slide a couple of the most influential books which uh, go into this direction. So we see from the titles, from the subtitles, you know, that it's everywhere is a threat to democracy. There's this idea that uh, populism is inherently anti-pluralist. That's one of the major uh, arguments. Yeah. Basically, be, because of being anti-pluralist is that also per se, as such, undermines constitutional liberal democracy. And then we said, if we, you know, move from the world of uh, sort of, you know, theory to a real world, you know, we look at the, you know, the populists around the world, we sort of detected this kind of, you know, conceptual overstretch of this sort of, uh, you know, single dimensional, unidimensional definition of populism, because there were too many different phenomena, you know, going on around the world, different versions of populism that cannot be simply captured by this simple view of, of populism, which basically says that it's, you know, antithetical and anti-constitutional. So uh, our first task was then to go from the beginning to start with a sort of a few conceptual things to define a constitutionalism first, where we adopted a pretty, I would say today is common, you know, standard definition. It, it, is a, it is a thin definition of constitutionalism, but for us, it was important to stay with the thin definition because we wanted to be as broad as possible in you know, debating the compatibility between this uh, uh, definition of constitutionalism with the forms of populism. And uh, I, I won't spend much time on, on what we do mean by thin. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's a usual thing. It's, you know, it's Robert Dahl, it's very proceduralist and so on. So then we move to populism and we want to, here we had also quite a, a, a difficult task because populism, uh, according to the mainstream literature, as I said, sort of had this special sort of uh, definition which, which portrays it as, 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 a, as, a, as, as I said, anti-plural, anti anti-constitutional and so on. So the first sort of, uh, is for me, uh, indication that you know there was a sort of a different opening in this direction was when Pippa Morris and, and Inglehart published their book Cultural Backlash. They were the first one to start to distinguish between authoritarian populism and other liberal democratic populism. On the other hand, so we review this literature and then um, uh, we come. Uh, uh, well, this is also from Pippa Morris uh, book, one of her also charts which shows uh, you know, varieties of populism with very different political constitutional connotations. Mm -hmm. And you can actually see that you know, some of them you know, are indeed authoritarian as, uh, as uh, the literature argues, but there are others who are different. You know, we see that there are some of them are even progressive liberal populists. So that was the something, you know, something different, something for, important for us uh, uh, to, to explore. Um, so also uh, the way, so this is borrowed from somewhere else. This is not from, from our book. So we went uh, into this sort of literature and, 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 and in the end um, came out through our overview of the literature to the conclusion that uh, the most accurate uh, view is to you know, talk about you know, very different versions of populism that happen in different uh, local circumstances with, uh, as I said, very different ramifications for constitutional law and for politics. And yes, some of them, end up at the lower point of this picture. They become you know, illiberal, even authoritarian in the end, but others you know, can also end up on the upper part of the far right end of your picture and you know, represent a bottom-up, participative, direct democracy version of, of populism. So the, the second conclusion was not only that there are all these varieties, but also in order to understand their relationship with constitutionalism, we have to study them in a particular context. So in other words, we try to move away from this debate about populism as such and constitutionalism as such. So then here we move, this is so the, the second part of the book. So from the conceptual part, we move to the second part, conceptual one, where we have case studies and we have a, you know, country case studies. And also we have a structural issues which are lumped together into case studies. So, uh, you know, we didn't even want to be exhausted. We, you know, were very selective. We, uh, you know, we, 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 we have a, you know, Eastern Europeans, because as you know, the, you know, the, the backsliding as it's called, you know, started very early there. Uh, but also we have Western Europe, uh, conservative populists. We look at the Italian case at the Austrian case. Uh, 
uh, we look at the Brexit, and then we have certain Europeans where we find this different progressive version with Syriza and Podemos in Spain. Um, and one of the, of course, the, 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 the issues is also that we try to look at what these populists do in reality, not only what do they say, you know, in their manifestos, in their programs before they get to power, and the, uh, the, 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 the case studies very clearly show that some of them, yes, end up as authoritarians. And here uh, we um, discuss, you know, work also of other people who suggest that in that circumstances, we might better call them authoritarians masquerading as populists who are less populist and more authoritarians. And uh, for example, uh, you know, we, as, you know, we try to, because we are not political scientists, we try to, you know, uh, absorb as much literature as possible. And in the five, five, last five, four years, believe me, there was enormous explosion of the literature. So, so there was a, hardly a book that we didn't share in the last, you know, year or two when we were working on this project. And so just, you know, maybe refer to a few of them. And uh, um, one of the most interesting, for example, things for me was that Syriza, one of the, here I'll be very selective because of the lack of time. Syriza, you know, the Greek, uh, you know, a party in power from 2015 to 2010 was very often by many very serious political science account identified as a version of authoritarian populism. And then we look at the, you know, the constitutional developments in Greece, and we didn't find uh, any strong serious empirical proof for that claim, even though it was made by, you know, extremely serious scholars of populism in, in, in political science literature, and then also usually followed by many public law constitutional scholars. So there was this narrative which basically look at their uh, sort of, uh, you know, the, the, the range of, of policies of reforms they started to enact. And then it, this range of policies got the name, was called sort of authoritarian playbook. And as soon as they started doing certain reforms with, you know, the certain institutions, they were immediately accused of following the so-called you know, in different contexts, this tool book has different names. Some call it Orban, you know, according after Victor Orban, Orban's toolkit toolbox, other call it Trump's toolbox, and so on and so on. So to make the long story short, no, I mean, there was, you know, few in, uh, isolated criticism of courts, which were quite uh, uh, unfriendly, actually, to many reforms of Syriza and so on, but there was no, absolutely no serious attempt to undermine democracy. On the contrary, as one of the you know, serious scholar of populism, Kasmude, in one of the first book on Syriza, finds at the end of the study, they were basically working within the confines, within the parameters of liberal democracy. Tsipras ended up being pretty normal liberal democrat, very far from authoritarian. And then we also find something very similar also for the right-wing versions of populism. So we look at the uh, short-lived uh, coalitions in Italy between Cinque Stelle and uh, Lega, and we look at the Austra Austrian case, and apart from, you know, of course, harsh words, uh, threats, which might, you know, undermine the unwritten norms, which of course are extremely important of constitution, is that there were very few direct violations. So we are not saying by that, that we endorse any of this movement. We are simply because the focus of our attention here is the central question, whether populism always in every instance conflicts and it's disruptive of, of uh, constitutionalism or as, uh, uh, Nadia Urbinati uh, argues in her book is this figures democracy. So her central claim is that populist always as such disfigure democracy. And we simply uh, didn't find in our cases confirmation for that claim. Although again, as I said, there are instances where, you know, they uh, go much further and they, you know, by their reforms, uh, they undermine the rule of law, they undermine many, you know, uh, uh, poor, institution of liberal democracy and they end up more or less authoritarian. The good examples are you know, the Turkish president, Orban, Kaczynski now and so on, but even there the story uh, you know is not over yet, particularly in Poland. So uh, you know Poland is I think is a litmus test for you know whether uh, this kind of you know uh, nativist right-wing conservative populism will end up also being being authoritarian. So with uh, with uh, uh, you know opening up this space for this possibility of distinguishing between the authoritarian and progressive version, then uh, in the rest of this, uh, okay, I just wanted to say a little bit more about the, the, the second part, because we, we know all 
a lot about the authoritarian version. So I'll, I'll just skip the authoritarian part. It's been very well covered in the literature. We heard a lot. So, 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 so democratic populism, which is, you know, we argue is equally important, is less visible, less frequent, but it shows that, uh, you know, the, the populist politics can be used can be deployed for you know different purposes you know for democratic for democratization for for you know bringing you know quality uh, reforms important social reforms and so on and uh, this is one of the points that populists sometimes actually have to uh, you know uh, go against the veto points against the against the you know the the, the speed bumps as as we call them in, in the constitutional law literature because sometimes that's required in order to make certain things more democratic. One good, good example were fiscal rules in the EU where Syriza you know, fought the battle against the EU about the fiscal budget fundamentalism. So uh, the, 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 the study basically ends up with a pretty simple, but we think important conclusion that relationship between constitutionalism and populism show that this confrontation are often nothing more or less than attempts to find appropriate institutions consistent with commitment to constitutionalism that allow populist to deal with the political challenges they face. And I might provide more cases when we move to the discussion. So uh, as a result, and this is my last slide, you know, this democratic populism then for us, maybe it's not a, a, a problem as the mainstream literature argue, but maybe a temporary solution. So it should be considered as a response to an already existing deformity in liberal democracies, the overgrowth of oligarchic power. It should be considered as a badly needed corrective plebeian intervention against oligarchy. Whether this will be something that will stay for long or just a temporary moment is, uh, you know, another question. Mostly, you know, for political scientists to figure out and to say more about. It. Uh, and then the, this is the final part where we put some more normative thoughts on our vision of how this affects thinking about constitutional law after populism. Thank you very much. Thank you, Boyan, very much. Um, I wanted to invite people who are uh, uh, attending this event uh, to write their questions or thoughts in the Q&A uh, box. We will get to them as soon as uh, the panel completes their initial remarks. Um, Professor Mark Tashnet, please. Uh, thank you, and thanks for uh, hosting the event and, and the, attending it for those who I can't see. Um, I want to address three points. Um, the first two are about sort of locating uh, our book in the literature on populism and constitutionalism. And the third is a, a brief discussion of some of the normative theorizing we try to do in the last uh, chapter in particular. So uh, the first point is something that uh, uh, Bojan mentioned in passing, but I want to uh, uh, state more directly. Um, and it, it is the uh, assertion in the literature on populism that populist leaders say that they themselves speak for the people. So in the United States, when Donald Trump accepted the nomination, his line was, I alone can save you. Uh, and you read about uh, Hugo Chavez going on television every, I think it was every, uh, Sunday morning, first eight hours, talking to the people, telling people, telling the people what they wanted. Uh, and so populism in this leader is mode is represented not as trying to determine and implement what the people want, but rather is the intuited position or the position that the leader takes and then attributes to the people. Uh, now, of course, there is, uh, as Boshan has emphasized, there is some leaderism in some populist movements, uh, but we want to stress that in many instances, uh, the people who are identified as leaders who say that they are speaking for the people but actually are speaking for themselves uh, are heads of fairly complicated uh, coalitions. Uh, the populist party, maybe the leader speaks for the populist party, but the party itself in many instances is a coalition. 
uh, again, not always, but, uh, uh, but sometimes. So uh, for example, uh, uh, in uh, Ecuador and uh, Bolivia, uh, uh, there were prominent leaders, uh, uh, Rafael Correa and Evo Morales, who were um, described as you know, speaking for the people. But it turned out, and maybe it should have been known from the outset, that their parties were coalitions. And if they failed to manage the coalition, their, their position was weakened uh, to the point where both of them were eventually in some complicated ways uh, forced out of office by, not by uh, an opposition that took over. In, in Morales' case, it's complicated because there was a quasi-military coup, but he already, his position has already been eroded from within uh, his coalition. Um, and, and technically, uh, in Poland, PIS is a coalition government, heads a coalition government, and there are these weird stories that crop up occasionally about things that have to be done in order to keep the coalition uh, uh, together. Um, a footnote on this, incidentally, um, this is more my hobby horse than Lorian's. Um, part of the story th that is often neglected is failures on the part of the opposition to, uh, to get their act together. So in Venezuela, it's quite clear that for a long time, Chavez and now Maduro uh, lacked, uh, substantial, lacked the kind of support that they had, that Chavez had at the beginning. But the, the, the opposition just couldn't and still hasn't been able to organize itself coherently uh, to oppose them. Um, uh, in, in Hungary, one reason that Orban's hung on is that until recently, uh, the opposition was fragmented. And so if you have a fragmented opposition and a unified governing party, the governing party is going to win. Um, okay, that's the first point. That leaderism is a more complicated phenomenon. Uh, second point is something Bojan did talk about, and this is I have this is sort of the story about uh, the case study chapters eight and nine, the functional uh, chapters. Um, it's often said that populists are anti-institutionalists, anti and that's shown by their enthusiasm for amending the constitution. Uh, what we try to argue in those chapters eight and nine is that there's a political logic to uh, uh, this, uh, uh, these amendment projects. Uh, uh, and the, the basic logic starts with two points. Uh, or one uh, point about time. And here we draw on Stevens Koranic. There's chronological time, the clock is just ticking political time, when is the next election, and what I'll call your judicial time, which is when are you going to be able to replace the judges on the court that were there when you came in into power. Okay, so now you come into power with an ambitious reform agenda. Uh, you want to do things, but uh, you have to do them uh, in, within the constraints of uh, calendar time. Uh, so you might face an upcoming election. Uh, and you might think that you don't have time to accomplish the ambitious agenda, given the existence of what we already mentioned, a veto gates in the process. So what do you do? Well, you try to get rid of some of the veto, veto gates so they can get done what people elected you to do. Uh, and sometimes this is the case studies of extending presidential terms. You try to extend your terms. Um, and there's a logic to that. And, and it's, it's not necessarily anti-constitutional. Uh, it's particularly because the constitution itself with an amendment process says, we know the constitution drafters said, we know we may not get it exactly right. And we provide these opportunities for the people when they want things done differently to change the veto gates that we have. Um, um, okay, uh, so when you look at, this is the takeaway from much of the second part of the book, 
when you look at what populists try to do, uh, in particular in connection with constitutional change, reform, abuse of constitutionalism, actually what you have to look at is the merits of what they're trying to accomplish. Uh, are they uh, authoritarians masquerading as populists or are they democratic populists facing uh, obstacles that uh, can be reduced slash eliminated without, again, to using, using urban audience terms, without dis disfiguring democracy. Okay. Now, my final point is uh, the normative stuff. So what is populist constitutionalism? Uh, and uh, uh, our basic argument is that populist constitutionalism is an argument for not democracy everywhere at every moment, but for more democracy than we now have. Uh, and uh, we have a discussion of why it isn't instantaneous democracy everywhere uh, at every moment. Um, uh, and I won't, won't go into that, but in practice, populists don't uh, advance instantaneous democracy on every issue at every moment. Um, we have this thought experiment, uh, which I'm happy to talk about in, in the Q&A, of suppose you had a populist government, government uh, implementing uh, a COVID policy. Uh, what would it be? Uh, and we talk about what our more democracy populism would, would do uh, and involves uh, generalizing ideas about citizen assemblies and uh, participative, uh, uh, participatory polling, deliberative polling, a whole bunch of things that are out there that are happening uh, uh, and that could be pulled together into a more democracy uh, system. Um, the only, uh, and, and we've seen it happening um, in the, the standard examples are Ireland and Iceland, which use that different forms of citizens assemblies to generate uh, significant constitutional reforms. Again, I could talk about the Icelandic story in more detail, more, more uh, detail, but um, the, the sort of bottom, the, the last point I want to make here is uh, we can see these citizen assemblies working and working, I guess the best way to put it is not, not um, any worse than representative democracy working. They're not utopia, uh, but neither is representative democracy. Um, so you have to compare things as they actually work. And we think that uh, citizens' assemblies probably would work no worse than representative democracy. The final point I want to make is uh, one about scale. Um, so yeah, these citizens' assemblies work and they get stuff done. Uh, but can they be scaled up onto a national uh, uh, level? Uh, uh, here we rely on uh, recent, book by, recent books by uh, Len Landamore at Yale and Camille Vergara, who's been at Columbia, uh, which have fairly detailed arguments about how, in fact, you can scale these things up uh, to a national level. You have to do some institutional innovation and things like that, but basically scaling probably can be handled. At least we think it's worth a try. Um, okay, that's it. Thank you so much, Professor Tashnet. Uh, we have now uh, Professor Vivian Schmidt, uh, who is now in the heart of Europe from Rome, I guess, um, studying populism as we speak. Yes, so not in Rome, on in Liguria, on the border between France and, and Italy, but close enough. Um, so I'm really delighted to be discussing this book. Uh, I think I find it a very welcome addition to a very large literature on populism. I mean, I think if you, if you can see my shelves back here, there's so many books and they just keep, I mean, because as I'm trying to write on populism as well, it's just overwhelming. So, you know, it's, it's quite impressive simply that you managed to tackle such such a large issue. And importantly, you help clarify one important aspect of populism, which is your focus on constitutionalism, law, and how so-called populists may re revivify and not simply undermine democracy. 
The book itself is very readable, nicely balanced, I find, between engaging with theoretical questions and dealing with the empirical reality. So, you know, kudos to you both for, for writing a book that is wonderful to read uh, and also provides many, many insights. I also like your approach of thin constitutionalism. When you write about thin constitutionalism, I basically think of the tenets of liberal democracy, free and fair elections, majority rule, and entrenchment in, in terms of certain rights. But I think you take this um, um, a step fa farther and, and, and bring to life what this means, uh, what thin constitutionalism mean, means. Uh, your approach to populism I find really good, um, especially because I think you're absolutely right to reject the majority view of populism, uh, which sees it almost invariably is dangerous, anti-democratic, involving an authoritarian slide. Um, you're also right to see problems of selection bias and perfectly agree, really, really important to see so many varieties of populism and the fact that there are positive varieties of populism and not simply negative ones. So democratic populists versus authoritarian ones, that's an important distinction. Um, so all of the good things. So now I just have to say one thing that I find, uh, you still really don't leave us with a definition of populism other than that there are many varieties. Um, so I still wanna ask, what is a populist? Who is a populist? Um, yeah, so, you're legal scholars, you're focused on constitutional issues, you're concerned with institutions, populists in power. And so you don't necessarily have to engage with that, with my question, but you know, I'm a political scientist, I've got to find definitions. So, um, so I wanted to take a few minutes out to try to find my own, to, to, to discuss my own way of defining populism, what is populism, how it works, but I think it's completely in tune with what you've been talking about. So, so if, if we look at the political science literature, it's actually divided into, in, into two main literatures. One is investigations of the sources of populism, and the other is the nature and scope of populism. So those focused on the nature, on, on the sources of populism, kind of delves deeply into the structural institutional causes of citizens' discontent. That's not the focus of your book, although that comes up, but it, it, it's, it actually resonates with a lot of what you're saying because this set side of popular, of, of, of sort of the literature of political science investigates populist the sources, the socioeconomic, sociopolitical and, and political sources of populism and how they play themselves out in party systems. So this is about people feeling left behind by globalization and Europeanization, people worried about the loss of status and the changing faces of the nation, people wanting to take back control unhappy with mainstream parties that are no longer responsive to citizens, um, whether their concerns and their demands, uh, unhappiness with institutions that don't work and unhappy with politicians. And actually in your book, that is really, I think you, you talk about that a lot, which I think is important. Um, all of this supports your case that populist discontent has real causes and that populists are right to protest. Um, even though well, what's clear is you have a general bias in favor, which I do, you like the generally progressive left-wing populists who focus more on inclusiveness than you do the right-wing populists who are more exclusive. Okay, but so one part of the literature focuses on the sources of discontent. Another part of the literature in political science is more intent on defining populism and describing its many forms. And this is really where you focus at your critique. Um, uh, these are, are, are the people who focus on populist ideas, leaders, parties, in and out of power. Um, and here actually this, Part of the literature often takes the populist discontent as given and doesn't deal with it. And of course, it's often biased against all populism. It's also, as you rightly point out, confusing. 
you know, it's also the case, and actually you do this as well, populist in power can be mainstream politicians as, opposed, as, as well as extreme right, extreme left, you know, think of Berlusconi um, versus extreme right uh, Salvini in the Lega or the extreme whatever radical center, I like to call it, of the five star movement. Um, of uh, Beppe Grillo and more recently others. Um, but you've got Bernie Sanders in there as well as Trump. I certainly know lots of uh, scholars of populism who would be horrified to think that you mention, you know, that you put Bernie Sanders in as well, or that you even mention FDR. But I think you're right to do this. This really demonstrates the kind of confusion of the term. And I think this is why you rightly say, whoa, there are real problems with this definition. Um, so my own way in is actually to look at the dynamics of populists um, increasing ideational and discursive power. So I like to think of this as the discursive construction of discontent. Um, and thus, you know, I, I think of sort of four Ms. <laughs> Um, it, that one should investigate, that one investigates the content and style of the messages, the qualities of the messengers in terms of personalities, rhetoric, and rhetorical resonance, the nature of the medium regarding the channels of network-based activism and of media-based messaging and interaction, and then the characteristics of the milieu in terms of the institutional context, the specific sources of discontent, and the situational logics. Um, and I don't, I'm just, just to go into this in a bit more detail, you know, if, if, if we think about populism, it's many things and it's one thing. At its core, it's the, as I mentioned before, the discursive construction of discontent. Populism employs the rhetoric of us versus them, we the people versus the elites, et cetera. But their charismatic leaders use such language to rally a wider range of supporters as they claim to speak in the name of the people for the people as me the people in Nadia Urbinati's terms. Um, their uncivil discourse breaks taboos, promoting an aura of authenticity or creating a post-truth post universe through exaggerations, distortions, fake news or lies. And you actually don't focus much on that. But importantly, they attract followers not only because of the style of their discourse, but also because of its substance, appealing to people's emotions, anger, fear, anxiety, as well as to their reasons for discontent, economics, economic, social, or political. And their appeals to emotion may build on issues of class, identity, or sovereignty, and their reasons may be socioeconomic, sociocultural, and political, as I've already mentioned. So, that's about the messages and the messengers. But in addition to that, we all also need to consider the medium, you know, in the famous, which in the famous words of Marshall McLuhan is the message. Um, but so if this is also about populist ideas and discourse are disseminated by social networks, real or virtual, attracting followers while adding force to anti-system social movements and political parties. But while their messages generally spread in posts, tweets, or sound bites, you know, are, are spit, are their, while their messages are generally spread in posts, tweets, or sound bites through the social media, they're picked up and ampl amplified by the traditional media as the news of the day. And of course, all of this, messages, messengers, uh, medium, can have profound effects on the milieu in which populist operates and vice versa. And I think the milieu is really what you're focused on, which is, which, which is sort of recognizing that populism is by its very nature grounded in national politics and polities, and therefore draws on context dependent concerns while being shaped by context specific institutions, even though there may be supranational spillovers and transnational influences. Um, but, you know, whatever the context, populism manifests itself, as you have rightly said, in many political forms on the extremes of the right, left, on the extremes of the right, on the extreme seemingly at the center, because referencing issues on both ends of the spe 
of the spectrum. But importantly, also, as, po as populist polarization grows, mainstream political parties and civil discourse wither, with centrist leaders unable to frame the terms of the discourse or to recenter the conversation. And you know, to conclude, um, the target of populist anti-system politics is liberal democracy for, for not being what it is cracked up to be and for being broken, cracked, if you will. And that's your focus as well. Um, and of course, populism, as you, as you yourselves have said, brings it with it many dangers for liberal democracy populist while out of power may under, undermine traditional norms of tolerance and speech and behavior, but once in power, they may attack liberal institutions, uh, including the separation of powers, the integrity of elections, freedom of the press, independence of the courts, as you write in your book. So the populist threat really can include the potential drift to illiberalism and authoritarianism, as you write, but importantly, as you emphasize, it can also have some benefits. It can be a litmus, test for, a litmus test for the state of democracy to draw attention to the problems of existing systems, um, even if they may identify the wrong causes, creating scapegoats rather than offering solutions. But of course, there are many differences amongst populist anti-system parties, and they often tend to be more pragmatic and many are not illiberal. So finally, you know, just to say what I'm offering to you is a kind of definition that uses the discursive construction of discontent as a lens through which to consider these variegated uh, aspects of populism. But of course, what I'm saying in no way substitutes for what you're saying. I hope that it just adds a little to your excellent discussion of populism and uh, constitution, the thin constitutionalism. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vivian. Uh, we have now our next uh, discussant, Professor Robert Tsai, uh, an American constitutional law expert here at the UNO. Please. Hi, thanks for having me. Uh, it's, it's a real pleasure to uh, read this book. Um, it, it really is a terrific and provocative effort to synthesize uh, large bodies of scholarship uh, and to, to tell us something new about both populism and constitutionalism. Uh, let me just make a couple of general remarks and then I wanna hone in uh, on the particular methodology that uh, Bojan and Mark uh, take in the book. And then I wanna pose a few questions. Um, as far as the general remarks, um, uh, you know, besides being a terrific synthesis, I do think that it's um, noteworthy in that it is far ranging in its geographic scope, taking us from Brazil to Greece, from Hungary to Italy. It is also far reaching theoretically uh, as a project covering different forms of left wing populism um, based on broad and often egalitarian visions. For example, Bernie Sanders failed presidential bid and the coalition he's continuing to try to keep alive. Uh, um, uh, as well as the Syriza party in Greece already mentioned, that's actually governed for a time by attacking austerity policies. Um, and their um, theoretical breadth also covers uh, right-wing forms of authoritarian populism found in Brazil um, uh, in the uh, rule of, of Bolsonaro, as well as that of Orban in, in Hungary. Um, the question I think that, that, the, that the authors uh, spend quite a lot of time on, the, the one that they pose an answer, is simply whether populism is compatible with constitutionalism. And their answer is yes, in the abstract, that there isn't anything inherent to populism that makes it intrinsically uh, anti-constitutional. Although there can be certain movements or as becomes more clear in their discussion of the different experiences, certain proposals or certain actions that uh, leaders or parties might take that could be more accurately described as anti-constitutional. Now, how do they answer this question in the way they, uh, they have? Um, I want to here focus on the moves that they make. Um, first, and, and I think there are really two moves um, already alluded to before, but I want to I want to make it clear for others who haven't read the book. The first is to make well, the general approach is to reduce the inherent friction 
between these two concepts, constitutionalism on the one hand and populism on the other. Um, so the first move is to make constitutionalism minimalist, as already been mentioned before, to make this idea thin. And what they've done is to just simply describe constitutionalism as characterized generally by things like majority rule, some entrenchment, say, of rights uh, and certain amount of powers, uh, a degree of judicial independence, and then, of course, the existence of, of parties. Um, they also haul out populism in order to make it capacious. Um, so what they say is that, the, that populism is really characterized um, not by a single definition, but really some themes that tend to come up, which then upon analysis, they say, uh, is much more complex when we look at the different forms of populisms that exist. So for example, they say that uh, populists tend to use rhetorical tropes such as the people versus the elites. They tend to attack the existence of corruption um, this could also be, of course, a source, as uh, Professor Schmidt has, has recognized, that uh, in, a, in a climate in which it is perceived to be widely corrupt, um, we will see this form of rhetoric arise and populists along with them. Um, another theme that they mentioned is that populists often are, but they don't need to be charismatic. And then finally, uh, a theme that they mentioned is that um, populists tend to have an anti-institutionalist orientation, although, again, this is more complex upon uh, a further examination uh, because uh, while they don't often accept legal rules and institutions as they exist, or they don't always respect that those institutions have ultimate power, um, they often do seem to act within a system and seek reform or regeneration of the broader system as a whole. Now, here's a, here's a kind of a quibble, and I think this is along the same uh, vein as um, one raised by Professor Schmidt, and that is that as far as populism is concerned, um, after what they've done with it, it's not clear to me on what basis they decide who is a populist and who isn't. Um, that, that is to say, it's, it's not clear to me whether it's, this is a matter of style or substance that defines a populist. Uh, one of the things that jumps out to me, uh, since I, I tend to focus on the American experience, is they say in a couple of places that LBJ isn't a populist. Now, it's true that LBJ doesn't come to power in the same way that many of more recent populists have by making a certain set of popular appeals, right? He kind of inherits the position uh, because of the assassination of his predecessor. And it's also true that LBJ wasn't charismatic in the usual sense, but he did have a dominant person personality. And he did substantively during his uh, time in office, try to embrace the civil rights movement. Um, and through his rhetoric and his policies, he tried to join two very popular moments, right? The New Deal and the civil rights period in which he was living. Um, and so I think this is an example that jumps out as uh, one that, that kind of cries out for um, further discussion of, as to why LBJ isn't deemed a populist within their framework. Uh, let me come back to the two conceptual moves I, uh, I articulated before that I see them making. Wh why make these moves? Why, why make constitutionalism thin and then hollow out the notion of, of populism in order to make it capacious? I see that, that the authors seem to be driven by, by two goals. One is to achieve greater uh, conceptual clarity, perhaps, of those two terms, which have been muddied by overusage uh, and confused usage. And so that once we see that there are many possible constitutionalisms and many different populisms that might share perhaps family resemblances, then we see limitations with those concepts, right? They don't. They're not able to answer all of the hard questions that we, we may want to engage in, for example, in terms of um, uh, democratic design or institutional design, which uh, things we might want to uh, endorse or, or oppose. This leads me to a second motivation, I, I, I think, is uh, pushing the authors to make the, these two moves, and that is to re perhaps reduce distortion in the debates that we want to have, whether it's in the scholarship or in politics generally. And they say in a couple of places that we should not support or oppose some ideas, say some reform proposals, simply because it's proposed by a populist, right? Uh, uh, um, uh, we ought to turn to other, other metrics. Now, by thinning out what constitutional means and hollowing out what populism might mean, the authors then give us a method. Um, or at least I think it's a method. And that is that, uh, if we're trying to answer the question of what is constitutional, 
whether a populist leader, uh, we should focus on whether a populist leader, a movement or a proposal is constitutional on its own terms, or as the authors say, on their merits. Well, what does that mean on the merits? Um, the, the authors propose that what we ought to think about is what is plausibly, um, or what could be plausibly characterized as a form of good government. Um, we ought to look at the proposals or ideas in piecemeal fashion when we evaluate these things, with one exception, where the interactions between the specific reforms significantly alter the function of the constitutional order to favor an existing party or regime. Their example, uh, they've got others, but the one that really jumps out is Hungary, where a party wins democratic elections and then uses that leverage to um, change the rules to make it easier to write a new constitution. A number of these reforms taken on their own are not anti-constitutional, don't appear to be, and they might even be good ideas. But when you put them all together, they clearly are motivated by a desire to sideline opposition parties uh, and to uh, gain control of key institutions across, uh, across time, uh, to manipulate judicial time by adding judges, uh, and to engage in uh, other uh, uh, creative and, and troubling reforms, such as banning the high court from relying on precedent before the date of uh, the new constitution. Here are some questions I have for the authors. Um, it seems to me that much then actually depends on what the authors mean by good government. Um, this comes up, I think, productively in their discussion of presidential term limits. Uh, they draw on what they describe as a consensus of constitutional systems around the world to say that two terms are enough. Of course, this can be overridden for urgent need and that they then are willing to describe this as part of their description of minimal constitutionalism. But again, I think this raises the question of what they mean by good government. Um, is good government merely the recognition of a social fact that is widely shared? That is to say that what is good is what a consensus of countries apparently decide is good uh, by virtue of, of adopting the practice or um, do we also have to engage in some kind of independent judgment? Uh, and is that what the authors are doing according to other criteria? Because at times it does seem that this is also what is going on. In other words, that, that as the authors are pushing us away from uh, populism as a way for answering questions, um, that we need to look at other things like the particular forms um, uh, of politics that seem to be present in the ecosystem. Um, all right. Um, the book ends optimistically about populism and constitutionalism by discussing creative uses of constituent assemblies and referenda. Much of the criticism of how things have been often done using these vehicles, again, have to do with, I think, good government judgments. This raises uh, issues of transparency of legal change, as well as whether those changes reflect what we might describe as broad and deep support. And on that note, I want to turn to Donald Trump because he shows up, but, but not as often as you, you might expect in this particular book. I understand if uh, they think that most of us are overly saturated with thinking about him. Um, but I, I'm wondering then of the author's judgment uh, of the extent to which Donald Trump's proposals were in fact anti-constitutionalist. Um, and I'll just throw some things out there. Of course, the actions of January 6th, uh, 2021, particulars theory that allowed the vice president to aggrandize the counting of electoral votes seems to be at least the best case that that is an anti-constitutional uh, form of activity. But what about his continued efforts afterward to sow doubt about the election results? Do the authors think that this is just protected and permissible speech or is it anti-constitutional even in the thin sense that they describe? Uh, you both uh, talk about his uh, underreach um, when it came to handling the pandemic. But what about in the area of immigration, where the administration, I think, quite successfully targeted Muslims, restricted severely the migration of brown people, and shut down refugee and asylum entry into the country? If you look at each of these alone, formally, you might conclude that many of these things are constitutional. On the other hand, if you look at them together, then you see them clearly as part of an ethno-nationalist impulse. And perhaps, uh, even if they're not as complete as some measures might have been, his aggressive use of executive orders in this domain, his effort to blanket the field of social action, 
to overwhelm and dare the, the high court to stop him seems largely to have worked in his, during his tenure. He was able to gain con, uh, greater control of immigration law judges uh, and the number of people they can um, grant asylum and refugee status to, as well as using uh, um, acting heads of agencies as workarounds and to stymie accountability. So um, let me end there. Uh, and I, I would certainly love to hear uh, uh, the authors react to a number of the, uh, of the questions I've raised. Thank you for writing such a provocative book. Thank you so much. So um, uh, I think we have a lot on the table for discussion, but I would like to add a couple of inputs from the from from the audience. Um, we have a question that uh, resembles the question about Donald Trump, which is, uh, let's uh, put this in a live context. What do you make of populism in the Philippines uh, as we are uh, as it is now? Uh, and this is a question from Uriel uh, Astillero. And then we have a question from Brazil, uh, which is not directly about the Brazilian context. It's a question about uh, the position of the authors, this clarifying the position of the authors vis-a-vis -vis the argument of scholar uh, Nadia Ordinati. And the second question again by Eduardo Coimbra from Brazil, which is, could the frequent occurrence of measures of what Professor Tashnet called constitutional hardball indicate an important criterion to differentiate the progressive and authoritarian versions of populism. And then there is a question by um, uh, Zach Schneider, uh, which I think Professor Tashnet uh, partly already uh, addressed in his remarks, but uh, um, it has to do uh, with the, the extent to which populist attitudes driven by institutional characteristics uh, um, uh, might be in fact uh, be less important than individual affective dispositions towards government. Uh, in other words, to what extent is populism driven by emotional, social, sociocultural characteristics or plain economic or political incentives? So uh, let me add this uh, to the table and leave it to the authors for a response in whatever order you guys want to go. Maybe this time Mark first and Boyan later, to, just to for. Okay. Uh, I, um, there's a lot on the table. Uh, and I'm not going to address everything in detail. Um, I, I, let me start with the uh, uh, Professor Schmidt's question about what is populism. And she, I think, correctly uh, identifies the, a, a, um, a concern about our exposition. Um, uh, I suppose because I think our primary account has actually two components, um, but neither of which actually tells you what populism is. So one of the components is that, again, in our primary account, is that um, populists, although they use the rhetoric of us versus them and so on, are not anti-pluralist in principle. Um, the, the rhetoric of us versus them is a uh, political organizing tactic, a uh, way of um, explaining why your political program is better than your opponent's uh, political program. Um, and in addition, as my mention of Morales and Correa, uh, indicates um, the uh, populists are internally pluralist or can be internally pluralist. Uh, so we have a, we, we don't do a historical uh, analysis with reasons for that, but uh, we do note that in the United States, historically, the uh, populist party and its successors in the United States were former labor parties, expressly pluralist, uh, coalitional. Uh, now, it's not farmers, labor, capitalist parties. Yes, they were running against somebody. Uh, but they weren't, again, uh, conceptualizing the American people as a unitary people from whom their opponents were excluded. Uh, but that's a negative component. 
Uh, a second component is lots of things that populists do are things that politicians, all politicians do, particularly politicians in opposition and attempting to gain power. Um, uh, so uh, here, I want to stress uh, two things. Uh, um, well, yeah, several things in Professor uh, Schmidt's formulation about uh, the discursive construction of discontent. Um, um, first, there's the question of charismatic leaders. Um, and some leaders of populist parties are charismatic, others aren't. I mean, you know, the, the example we trot out regularly is Jaroslav Kaczynski in, uh, in Poland, who's about as gray a character and faceless a bureaucrat as you can imagine. Uh, but he's the leader of the populist coalition. Um, and my own view is that there are others, it's not clear to me, maybe Brian disagrees with this, that Boris Johnson is fairly described as charismatic. Um, he's got other characteristics, but uh, I'm not sure charisma is one of them. And then a footnote on this, which is not irrelevant. We don't talk, it's relevant to our conclusion, which is we're actually, we haven't seen sustained populism in power. Um, the only really good example is Orban and maybe uh, Duterte in the Philippines, um, uh, maybe Modi in India. Um, but to the extent that your party is charismatic, centrally charismatic, there's the classic Siberian problem of the institutionalization of charisma. You know, what, and, and, and um, Venezuela, great example. Uh, Chavez was a charismatic leader. His successor, Maduro, was not, and maintained power not through populism, but through authoritarianism. Um, just, you know, it's just it, the current Venezuelan government. Whatever you might think about the Chavez government, the current government is an authoritarian government. Um, okay, so because Chavez couldn't, didn't institutionalize his charisma. Um, I think uh, so we have similar comments about the uncivil discourse. Um, uh, not clear to us that that's a general characteristic either of populace or distinctively uh, of populace. Uh, and then finally, on the use of the mediums, uh, the novel mediums, I sort of think that all good political leaders, whatever their instincts, uh, are going to take advantage of the um, mediums that are available. So you know, uh, um, FDR did the fire shot chats because radio was a new medium. Uh, he actually broke a whole bunch of norms about campaigning. Uh, he accepted the Democratic nomination in person uh, in 1932. Hadn't been done before. Uh, uh, he actually sort of ran and was elected for a third term. Um, uh, uh, Kennedy and Nixon debated on television. Again, a new medium. Uh, uh, um, Trump uses tweets, Bolsonaro uses WhatsApp, they, until they change the terms of service of WhatsApp. Um, but that's what politicians do. They see what mechanisms are available to get their message across and they use them. Uh, some more effectively than others, but I think just, you know, it's just politics. Uh, and that gets back to the us versus them rhetoric. Us versus them. Uh, I, so there are two observations here. Um, one is at the moment of campaigning, the rhetoric of us versus them is almost inevitable. You know, vote for us, don't vote for them. Uh, now, you know, sometimes you don't see that. I think Joe Biden actually tried to avoid it. Uh, but a lot of times uh, you do. 
Um, and we quote FDR as, you know, I welcome their, they hate me and I welcome their hatred. Um, uh, let's see. I, wanna, I forgot. Uh, so, okay. Um, on um, the violation, uh, uh, there's a slide, a uh, question about the violation of uh, norms and, uh, you know, so January 1st is just an attempted insurrection, um, anti-constitutional by definition. Um, you know, if they succeeded, there would have been a different order in place. Um, the post September, uh, January 1st, uh, six uh, activities are, are, I think, interesting um, because um, if, in fact, there was widespread fraud that the existing institutions covered up, well, it's not anti-democratic to try to find out. Uh, so in principle, this audit in Arizona seems to me okay. Uh, now, I'm very skeptical that I will trust any conclusions that the people draw if the conclusions are that there was widespread fraud, but you know, let's see what evidence there is. If they, uh, you know, so if the evidence is they deleted an entire list of people and it turns out that they were using the wrong thumb drive when they said that, well, that's, you know, uh, no evidence of fraud. Um, if it turns out that they actually did delete, uh, that's something to be concerned about. Um, oh, and then just, just finally, uh, um, two final points. One, just in passing, we do mention Duterte, I think, once in the book at the very end. Um, we don't talk about him in detail because, frankly, neither of us knew enough about uh, the situation in the Philippines, except that I, I, I won't attribute this story on, um, uh, reading about the election campaign and how he uh, came to power, he seems to have been an authoritarian thug from the very beginning. And, uh, you know, there are sometimes, sometimes people want to, uh, vote for a thug because they want a thug to deal with the problems they're facing. Uh, but that's not, I don't think it's fair to say he's a populist thug, he's just a thug. Uh, somebody who, a thug who won an election because people wanted a thug. Um, and then uh, uh, just finally on the, what do we think good governance is? We actually don't talk about that because that's what we say is a question of the merits. Uh, and we have our views about what good, go good governance is. We're both of us located on the left. And so we have lefty ideas about what go good governance is. But that's our position on the merits. Um, if we thought, like Adrian Vermeule, that the governing policies of Orban were good ones, uh, then that would be good governance from his point of view. But it's the merits of the policies that are uh, uh, at stake. And, and we don't want to argue for our uh, view. OK, I'll stop there. Uh, Boyan. Yeah, Boyan, please. But I, I, I wanted to sort of add one more uh, thing here uh, to the discussion, if possible. So there is a sentence that caught particularly my attention in the preview of the book you sent uh, kindly our way. Uh, the sentence, our friends are under attack. Um, and that referred, of course, to the possibility that uh, liberal constitutionalists in academia have suffered uh, personally in terms of limitation of their personal freedom, et cetera, um, in, in uh, current populist uh, governments. And so there is, there are many uh, authors and some particularly vocal in Europe who say what the populist rulers are doing now is against whatever notion of constitutionalism you could possibly come up with. Uh, and that is a powerful argument, which your book kind of undermines. <laughs>
And uh, uh, so I wonder, uh, your, I mean, it's a very brave decision to write what you're writing now, but I wonder how, um, how and why this intervention in this time in history and politics. Uh, thank you, Daniela. So uh, if it's okay, I'll start with uh, Professor uh, Schmidt and then Professor Tsai, and then uh, with your uh, final uh, really uh, excellent provocative question. So about the definition of populism, I, you know, as a non-political scientist, as I said, we try to read as much as possible. And before hearing your uh, uh, definition, Professor Schmidt, for me, uh, and we acknowledge that in the book, uh, the most sort of, uh, you know, far encompassing was uh, Jane, uh, Professor Mainsbridge and Macedo wrote a, a short piece in the uh, Annual Review of Law and Political Science. And they, to me, they seem to come you know, closest to what I would like to have, but still they miss the constructive part, which you mentioned. And uh, I have to say again, you know, as, as a somebody who is not in the field, but is trying to read as much as possible, that this is precisely what is lacking because people who talk about the sources, uh, you know, talk about one dimension and people who talk about the definition, you know, talk, look at the, you know, try to look at the phenomenon, you know, uh, sort of, you know, this rooted from the, from the, from the, uh, you know, social forces which are behind the phenomenon. So, uh, and you mentioned uh, in various elements and what I really like particularly was also, you mentioned three or four times the word fear, anxiety and things like that. And I think this is really important, what really drives many uh, you know, both on the left and on the right, people who vote for populist. And here I might sound a little bit old fashioned, but I find, for example, the work of a very old fashioned, you know, author, Eric Fromm, very informative here, Escape from Freedom, where he talks about this, you know, social construction of fear. Of course, he talks mostly about, you know, the, the you know, that, you know, the book was written in 1941. He talks about, you know, authoritarians and the Nazis. But I think, uh, I think this narrative is, you know, has yet to be written. So I'm all, uh, uh, you know, ears about your new book, Professor Schmidt, and to see because honestly, I haven't seen. I mean, there were authors who tried to, to, you know, bridge this gap. Uh, try, but you know, it's mostly, you know, debate is mostly supply, so-called supply and demand side. You know, but it, I haven't seen a very good explanation how that how that connects together the both part of the question. Um, uh, then uh, to um, and. You're also the, the 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 last point. Yes, they do attack liberal democracy. That's true. And uh, but you know there are two points here. Sometimes they end up on a different, uh, dangerous end. You know, and we ought to you know uh, you know criticize them. But you know sometimes also you know criticism of liberal democracy is what we need at the moment. You know, look at the EU Congress. You know, look at the there is a Tasmude somewhere has this sort of you know kind of nice uh, sentence. He says that you know illiberalism is in many ways response to undemocratic, uh, undemocratic liberalism in, 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 in several different decades. So that's, I think, one interesting way to look at it. Uh, and yes, it's very pragmatic populist. I really like that last line you mentioned. So that's, I think, further uh, sort of adds to our sort of, you know, constant critique that don't look at, you know, phenomenal as such, you know, look at the particular incarnation. You know, they, they vary, very, you know, and also they say, things, but they do it very differently in practice. So uh, very shortly, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really, you know, very excited to see to see your, your book as, as many others uh, before, Professor Schmidt. So then Professor Tsai, um, extremely difficult question, I would say. So uh, um, I don't know where to start, maybe with the, the last one. Uh, Mark, uh, I didn't hear that you uh, didn't talk much about Trump, and but I remember that we acknowledge that there's a small tiny footnote somewhere in the chapter where we disclose a little, uh, you know, we, a, a little you know, difference of view. So, you know, uh, where, and Mark, please correct me if, if I'm wrong, but Mark was a little bit more uh, uh, you know, positive, optimistic about the whole thing. And I was a little bit more pessimistic about it, but, you know, we acknowledge that and we didn't go any further. And also, uh, but uh, I agree that, you know, with uh, Professor Tsai's point, if you look, uh, if you use our framework and you look at the interactive importance of all the things that he did, you know, maybe he didn't destroy, you know, the rules per se, but, you know, he destroyed what Ziblatt and Levitsky called, you know, the culture, the unwritten rules, which sometimes are even more important to restore after they are destroyed, you know, uh, the mutual toleration, forbearance, and things like that. So, you know, how to, 
you know, meaningfully now discuss, you know, the, 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 you know, for example, you know, the reform of the court after, you know, all these rules have been destroyed in the past, you know. Now imagine you face, you know, this, you know, extremely powerful court with the six to three majority and so many federal, you know, circuit court judges, you know, for decades to come. And, you know, with the existing populist literature, any attempt to do anything, you know, about that would be immediately criticized as, you know, anti-institutional. So with our approach, I think, you know, we should call it, you know, as democracy restorative approach. You know, how exactly? It's, of course, a long and open question. Um, about, yeah, and uh, Mark's, uh, Mark uh, answered the good government question. So, um, the, uh, and I also like your point when you basically uh, go, uh, when you, you went through the arguments and you, you, you brought forward another important dimension, which we didn't explicitly mention in the presentation, I think, which is that power of the purpose, one of the purposes of, of this sort of, uh, you know, thinning out of the constitutionalism and then, you know, constructing populism to many different elements was also to try to move debate from, you know, to the to core, you know, disclose your political arguments, you know, don't criticize, you know, right-wingers because they're right-wingers, or because they're popular, but because they're right-wingers. Tell explicitly you don't like their own arguments, right? I think that's another important sort of a side product of, of, of this debate. And I think that's probably because what we see is sort of a, almost like a, you know, when populism emerged more forcefully, you know, in, in the last five, six, seven years in, in Europe, you know, you saw this sort of, a, you know, consistent attacks from the liberal, you know, the economist, financial times. So, you know, anyone who was, you know, diverting from the mainstream, you know, liberal media was a populist, you know, and that was absolutely not only counterproductive, but damaging, you know, for, 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 for meaningful political debate. So that's what I think that point was also uh, very important that you, that you brought forward in your, in your uh, discussion. Um, and I think I'm, I'm basically done here. There was only, uh, uh, yeah, the point uh, we didn't uh, answer explicitly the point about there was one written question in the chat function about Nadia Urbinati. We uh, have a few, we don't have an extensive discussion of her book, but we have a few references where we find, you know, her sort of a theory problematic, not because it's wrong as such, but again, because it takes populism as a general phenomenon, which leads only to certain political consequences. And for example, she uses in her book, example of uh, Cinque Stelle, and, 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 and she claims that the Cinque Stelle, you know, according to their ideas, you know, leads to disfigurement of democracy, and uh, we disagree with that. We don't think that that's right. I mean, you know, they were far, far more pragmatic than they promised in their initial program at the very beginning. Daniela, of course, your, your Daniela, sorry, your the most provocative question. So why this intervention at this particular time when there are fr our friends are in danger, uh, are we not sort of, uh, uh, sorry, I forgot your phrase, you didn't say playing with fire, but are, isn't this counterproductive in certain way? I would say no, no it's no, not. No, no, really, it's, it was, I didn't mean it as an aggressive question. I no, want no, no, no. opportunity to explain uh, how you position yourself in relation to that debate. No, no, I, I didn't take it. I think it's an absolutely crucial question, a necessary question, because you know, once you agree that there are two, you know, or many possible forms of populism, that's an absolutely legitimate question because, you know, if you, and especially if you look around the world, you know, it's the authoritarians that are prevailing. So that's a, that's a, that's a question that, you know, for political scientists, for Professor Schmidt here, right? So why we see only few, you know, progressive populists, you know, so why are authoritarians? So, so why in this climate of, you know, uh, dominance of authoritarian populists, we are trying to push forward this strong argument for, for democratic populism. Because again, uh, my uh, that's my point. I don't think we make this argument extensive in the bookmark, but my point is, you know, uh, the question why we have more authoritarians and why not more Democrats is a question, you know, about the social forces condition, not about populism per se. Once you accept the fact that there are many different forms of populism, then our debate is, I think it's perfectly legitimate because we acknowledge the danger, the fear, you know, we, we, we worry about our friends, you know, I'm Eastern European, so I know, you know, what does it mean, you know, if you're uh, Wojciech Sadurski, distinguished professor, you know, being sued by the government, you know, in, in several, you know, different you know, lawsuits and so on and so on. So, um, but, you know, yes, there is this danger, but there's, there's also promise. So we should distinguish between the two. Um, I'd like to take that up uh, as well. Um, and this is this is 
for my motivation, so not, you know, not us collectively. Um, the uh, book you mentioned that I published last year, Taking Back the Constitution, uh, argued that uh, it was only focused on the United States. It argued that we were approaching what I described as a constitutional inflection point where uh, there were uh, uh, real possibilities of either uh, Trumpism prevailing for another generation or so, or a renewed or a new, I would call it social democratic progressivism. Um, and uh, my motivation for uh, talking about uh, populism was to uh, provide uh, support for movements that were fairly described Sanders, I, Sanders AOC, fairly described as uh, populist movements that would push in the social democratic direction after the inflection point was passed. Um, and I didn't want uh, the discourse of populism to uh, lead people to say, you know, well, we can't, uh, you know, because populism is bad, uh, we can't go with the progressive populists. We have to restore the center. As against Trumpism, we're going to restore the center. Um, and I, I thought that was um, not, not the way to go. Um, there are lots of footnotes here to be attached to this. You know, I actually. I wasn't a Sanders supporter. I was a supporter of uh, Joe Biden because I thought he was more likely to return things to normal. Um, and it turns out that normal for him is actually pretty social democratically progressive, which is fine with me. Um, I, I forgot one point. Uh, our time's running out, but uh, uh, Professor Time mentioned the Muslim ban and uh, citizenship and, and immigration policies and so on. Um, we actually have a footnote on this or a parenthetical in it early in the book at the definitional stage. Um, and we define things with reference to citizens. Now, immigration and entry and citizenship status are very, I think, quite problematic slash difficult as a matter of liberal democratic theory. Uh, and we just didn't want to take those on. Um, so our definitional stuff is about citizens. Now, it could be that on reflection, we would end up saying that um, questions about citizenship yes or no, entry exclusion questions at the citizenship, the citizenship block, do have a fundamental constitutional component to them. Uh, I'm actually pretty skeptical about that, but maybe they would. All I can say is our discussion notes the problem, uh, but puts it to one side. Thank you. Thank you. We have a couple of minutes, perhaps, for final remarks from our discussants. We start this time with Robert, and then we let our former director of the center and founder of the center wrap up. Yeah, um, just to follow up this last point that, that I'm glad Mark um, brought back, um, I, I just wonder how stable it is to um, uh, set aside questions of, of uh, entry or citizenship as um, uh, unrelated to questions of either constitutional or populism, given that historically so much of the uh, forms of mobilization that we have seen seem to um, involve, right? Um, the identification questions that um, get stirred up by uh, 
attacking perceived outsiders and, 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 and going back to those basic definitional questions of political community. Um, so I just, I just, I guess just to push on that a little bit uh, and, you know, um, th this choice to kind of analytically put it to one side, wondering whether that's really stable. Thank you, Robert. Vivian. Uh, yeah, so what I'd like to say again is it's a wonderful book and really important. And uh, even though I said it's missing a definition of populism, the way in which you approach it, it's, you don't need it. Um, but what I do want to say is that uh, Mark's last comment on uh, you don't necessarily need to, to restore the center, I think, is really important. Um, what we need is a new way of doing politics that is, and, and so it may very well be that, that sort of a certain populist element may be necessary. And uh, I guess the last comment would be, how do we revivify the mainstream? Do populists return to the mainstream or create a new mainstream? Which in a way, if you look at Syriza in Greece, it has replaced PASOK as the center left, as a more, you know, essentially revivifying perhaps democracy. And so perhaps one could, maybe your next book could be on revivifying, you know, sort of mainstream, the mainstream through bringing populism back in to the liberal democratic uh, thin constitutional fold. How's that? Okay. All right. So wonderful and clearly to be continued. I truly appreciate the discussion, fundamental intervention in a debate that has very high stakes. And uh, I thank you all and I hope we stay in touch. All the best guys. Thank you again. Thank you.